Hi, everybody. I'm Sheena Jocelyn, and I'm delighted to be telling you today about our lab's work um, entitled Hippocampal Neuronal Allocation to an Engram Supporting a Memory in Mice. So my lab is really interested in understanding how the brain encodes, stores, and uses information. And because these studies can't be done in a human brain, we're going to be using the next best thing, maybe a mouse brain. So we're going to be looking at memories and how they're encoded, basically a memory trace or an engram. So um, our first question was, um, how are experiences or how is a memory represented in relevant brain regions at the circuit or um, neuronal ensemble level? And it could range from a very, very dense code where every single neuron is engaged all the way to a very, very sparse code, very much like a grandmother cell. And many studies suggest that it is a sparse code. So we said, okay, well, how are neurons within a brain region allocated or recruited to this sparse engram? And to examine this, we're going to be looking at a fear of threat conditioning. There's two varieties, auditory fear of threat conditioning, where we pair a, a neutral tone with an aversive stimulus, such as a mild foot shock. Then we can test the mouse anytime later. And we just replay the tone and say, do you remember the last time you heard this tone, you received this aversive foot shock? And they show us good memory for this by freezing or showing this defensive response to this tone. So in a series of experiments um, conducted um, over many years, we looked at how this um, auditory fear memory is represented in the um, lateral amygdala. So in a series of experiments, we have a bunch of neurons in the lateral amygdala and we used viral vectors, um, each expressing different constructs over the years, but the common denominator is that they all increase the excitability of these randomly infected neurons. So we micro-inject these viral vectors. These neurons that are infected are gonna have increased levels of excitability relative to their neighbors. And lo and behold, we found these neurons with increased excitability right before the time of training ended up becoming what we call an engram neuron. So a neuron that's really important in um, storing this memory. So um, these are very sort of correlational data and they suggest that neurons are allocated to a sparsely encoded engram based on excitability at the time of training. But are these neurons really necessary? Are they critically involved? So to test this, we're gonna use a very cool optogenetic construct, which allows us to increase and decrease the excitability of the same population of infected neurons using these two different optogenetic constructs. So if we shine a blue light, we're gonna hit channel rhodopsin, an excitatory construct, we're gonna increase the activity of these neurons. And if we shine a red light, we're gonna hit halo rhodopsin and basically silence these neurons. So this is what we did in the lateral amygdala to show that these neurons are critically important for later retrieval of this fear memory. So we're going to, um, uh, infuse a viral vector exposing both channel adopsin and halo adopsin. It's going to infect a, a sparse random population of cells in the lateral amygdala. We're going to shine the blue light. We're going to allocate these cells to the engram. How do we know these cells are alloc allocated? Well, we're going to test the mice under two conditions. Once normally without a red light, just say, what does the memory look like? And then when we specifically silence just these infected cells. And what does this show us? Well, under um, normal conditions without the red light, these mice show us a very high percentage of time freezing to the tone, shows us good memory, high freezing, good memory. Then when we silence just the small population of neurons, we've tried to allocate to the um, engram supporting this memory, we see a memory deficit. And we do not see this when we do not allocate these um, neurons prior to training. So if we just silence a small population of neurons, nothing happens to the memory. So in this background, we say, okay, is this effect generalizable to other brain regions, specifically the dorsal CA1 of the hippocampus? And here we've manipulated the excitability of these neurons. Does this happen endogenously? So first we're gonna rerun the exact same experiment, only now we're gonna look at a contextual memory. We're gonna have two groups of mice and one group, again, we're gonna allocate those neurons. This group non-allocated, we're gonna test mice under two conditions, normal conditions. And when we specifically inhibit just these infected neurons, we get exactly the same profile, suggesting that this activity or excitability dependent allocation happens in the um, CA1 of the dorsal hippocampus when we experimentally manipulate these neurons. Then we said, well, what's the profile? What does the activity profile look like when um, an animal is retrieving this memory? And for this, we're going to use GCAMP, a genetically encoded calcium indicator, just as a proxy of neural activity in, in these mice. And because we're gonna be taking up the blue and the green channel, we're going to use a red light sensitive optogenetic um, exciter to allocate neurons. So again, we have two groups of mice. In one group of mice, we're gonna allocate those neurons by shining the red light. 
we're going to try and see allocate these neurons into the engram. The other group of mice, they're just going to be random. We're going to train mice in, auto, in contextual fear conditioning, and we're going to test them. But during the test, we're going to read out the activity of all the cells that we've infected. Here, the cells allocated we think are important in the memory trace. In here, the cells not allocated, probably not important in the memory trace. Memory is equivalent in both groups. And here's what we see. So when a mouse enters a freezing bout during the test session, each time it's one of these dotted lines, we see this increase in activity of these allocated neurons. And we do not see this increase in activity if we do not allocate these neurons. When we align all the freezing belts to time zero, we really see this. This is at the population level. We're really interested in this at the level of individual neurons. If we find individual engram neurons, we're gonna trace their excitability back to before the animals have been trained and say, hey, are these neurons that are more endogenously excitable, are they the ones that are recruited or allocated into the engram? So for this, we're going to use um, a mini endoscope made by someone in my lab name of Chen. So we call them Chendoscopes and it's open source. Anyone can build them. So here's what we do. These are mice expressing again, G-Camp. We're going to train them in um, contextual fear conditioning and test them. And this is gonna allow us then to identify engram neurons and trace their activity back to before the mice were fear conditioned. So five minutes immediately before in the home cage, three hours and also 24 hours before in the home cage. And we're also gonna look at this in a different context. So based on their activity during the um, test, we're gonna identify neurons um, based on their activity, um, classify them as either engram or non-engram neurons. And with this, we have about 7% of the neurons we classified as engram neurons. And first we're gonna just do a sanity check. So um, during our endogenous experiment, we, this is the profile of all the engram versus non-engram neurons. And this looks really similar to what we saw in our um, experimentally allocated group. And we don't see this when we test them in a different context, the novel context. So this really suggests to us that we've identified engram neurons or neurons critically important in the memory in our endogenous case. So what do they look like before um, a mouse has been trained? Well, 24 hours before in the home cage, we see no um, difference in the excitability between these two populations of neurons during this five minute period when a mouse has been placed in this novel environment, we see that engram neurons seem to be more excitable and they're also more excitable immediately in three hours before. They are not more excitable um, in, the, in a different context test. So this suggests to us um, that these neurons are allocated to a memory trace or an engram based on excitability in the minutes to hours before training. And we did a bunch more analysis to suggest this is partly correct, but also pre-configured functional connectivity also influences allocation. So the brain is not a bag of neurons that it comes to us with somehow um, different neurons being functionally connected. The ones that are more excitable, the sub ensembles that are more excitable at the time of training, their, their, um, uh, their connectivity, functional connectivity seems to be enhanced by training. And it is these neurons that become um, allocated to the engram. So just as a sum up, we found that excitability dependent allocation does occur. And it occurs also in the context of pre-existing functional connectivity. So the brain is not a bag of marbles. It does come to us based with some pre-existing functional connectivity. And the most excitable sub-ensembles, these um, functionally connected bunches of neurons seem to be the ones that are allocated to an engram. This activity pattern seems to be stamped in at training and recapitulated later at memory uh, retrieval. That sub ensembles may be formed um, based on previous experience or maybe um, because of some hard wiring that we haven't yet um, investigated. And this is consistent with some notions of pre play or that there is some sort of pre configured sub ensembles with higher functional connectivity um, or some structure upon which learning occurs. And with that, I just want to um, thank my funders, my um, collaborators. This is my husband, Paul Franklin, my lab. This is us on our pandemic selfie day. And to let you know that we are always looking for um, students and postdocs. And with that, I want to thank you for your time and attention. I'm sorry I'm not with you in Glasgow, but the next best thing. Thank you so much.